We're going to be in Matthew chapter number 22. And on Thursday night, we'll, uh, we'll observe the Lord's Supper. This sermon tonight is sort of a preparatory sermon to get our hearts in tune for observing the Lord's Supper on Thursday night. And communion with the Lord, you know, sometimes we call it communion, Lord's Supper, Lord's Table. And uh, it keeps us in tune, keeps us in communion with the Lord. And uh, there's, there's that daily time when we can go to the Lord in prayer. And, and there's that time when we come to church and we fellowship with the Lord in church. But the Lord's Supper is a, is a special time. And it just kind of, it's a little more of a, I guess, a heart-searching time where we try to make sure we're in tune with God and on good grounds with our brethren. And it's not, it's not good to be out of, uh, out of sorts with your brethren. You know what I mean? Nobody wants to be crossways in your family or with your friends or on the job. You want things to go harmoniously, don't you? Huh? Now, let me know you're out there every once in a while. That way I won't go to sleep. We like to be in harmony. You know, you don't want to be like the man and his woman driving along. <laughs> man and his wife are driving along and they've been arguing and fighting in the car and just, man, they got on each other's nerves so much, they finally just, both of them clammed up. They weren't saying nothing. And they're just driving, both mad at each other. And they're driving along, and at long last, the husband looked over and saw a field over beside the road, and there's donkeys and pigs and goats in that field. The husband looked at his wife, he said, uh, relatives of yours? She looked back at him, she said, yes, in-laws. We don't want to be out of sorts with anybody. And the Lord's Supper helps bring us back into fellowship with people and into fellowship with the Lord. And so tonight I want to just read a, a few verses out of this uh, in Matthew chapter number 22. In verse, we'll read down through verse number 4, beginning at verse number 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. And he sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. And they would not come. And he sent, again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. Some people call that supper. In Arkansas, we call it supper, don't we? He's not talking about lunchtime, this is dinner. He said, I prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. In the older days in the east like this, they would have, I mean, they'd have a big shindig. When they had a wedding, man, they'd have a feast. They'd have banquets. They'd have food. And they'd, have, they'd have all sorts of festivities going on, sometimes for days on end and uh, before the, the wedding ceremony actually culminated. And so the, the banquet was a big deal. And the Jews were very big on hospitality and the host would make a big feast and, and uh, it, was, it was quite a layout, a lot of food, you know, and everything's done up nicely. And so it'd be kind of insulting to send out invitations to all the friends and neighbors and family and, and if they wouldn't come, that was kind of a sad time. And so this banquet was a big deal. And I want to entitle the message tonight, A Beautiful Banquet, A Beautiful Banquet. And again, this is to prepare our hearts for the supper we'll observe on Thursday night this week. It wasn't long after I'd been saved uh, in First Baptist Church in Mount Pleasant, Arkansas. Brother Sneathan was a pastor, and, and we had a pretty good team group. And so <clears throat> they, they told me they were having a, uh, a special supper for the teens. And uh, it was a supper I'd never heard of before the way the format was. And I began to ask questions, how, how does that work? And they would go load up the teens in a, in a van or a bus. And they'd drive to one location and they'd, they'd have part of a meal there and they'd uh, maybe have salad and soup and crackers and stuff and at the first course of the meal at one house. And uh, after they'd ate, prayed and ate and had that first course, they'd all load up on the van again and, and off they'd go. They'd go down the road to the next 
house and then they'd have maybe an entree. It might be German or Italian or Mexican food, but they'd go there and eat the main course. And when that one was finished, then they'd scoot off down the road to the next house. And when they came to the next house, this would be nice desserts. Boy, I'm talking about apple pie and pecan pie and coconut cake and well, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> and they'd have they now have all kinds of desserts, maybe coffee or milk and, and uh, mints. And they called it, you probably already know about it, I was green as a gourd back in those days. I didn't know nothing. And uh, they call it a progressive supper, a progressive dinner. Uh, some people call it a safari dinner. And uh, it was one that was progressing from one house to the next, to the next. And they make a whole evening of, of just eating. Now, that sounds good to me these days. I'd like to get in on it. I don't think teens ought to get... I know teens love to eat, but they are not the only ones, right? And uh, that sounds like a pretty good way to do a supper to me. God has a series of banquets and meals and suppers and dinners in the Bible, and I'd like to talk about two of them. Primarily, this one we're going to talk about tonight in preparation for the Lord's Supper. And this one that we talk about tonight is, is a meal where... The man, the father, has a son who's about to get married. And he invites everybody in the country. He says, come on over. Sends his servants out and delivers a personal invitation. He says, come on over. We're going to have a big wedding. And boy, we're going to have a fine banquet. And so he sends out his servants. And they go and invite people to come. And uh, <clears throat> this one tonight is one that ought to stir our hearts and, and get our soul ready. In fact, our soul ought to always be ready to fellowship with the Lord. Our soul ought to always be on fire to communicate and to commune and to fellowship with the Lord and His saints. And so that's what we're talking about tonight. And uh, I hope your soul will be elated and looking forward to the Lord's Supper on Thursday night. Uh, we lived in Denver. And I was on staff out there at a church and... We had taken our daughter, Angela, off over to Knoxville, Tennessee. It was the first year that Crown College started. And uh, we took Angela over there and dropped her off. Uh, the first year of college, it was her first year, and it was the college's first year. And so we dropped her off, and, and then we moved, we moved to, uh, to Denver. In fact, we moved from our kids a lot of times, but they always found us. And <laughs> well, we, uh, we were in Denver for a, a good while, and and Angela called me up one day and said, uh, Daddy, I'm, my, my belly's full of butterflies. She said, I'm so, I'm so tense and so scared, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, what's going on? And she said, well, uh, there's this young man in, in our church that's invited me to go out to lunch. And uh, she said, I don't know what to do. I said, well, has he proposed to you? She said, well, no, we've never been on a date before. He just asked me out to lunch. I said, so he's asking you out to lunch and you're upset and you don't know what to do? Uh, she said, yeah, what would you do? I said, I'd go eat. <laughs> and I said, it's not like you're going to marry the guy or anything. Yeah. Well, a few months later, after a courtship, she called me up and told me they were indeed getting married. And so we're in Denver. She's in Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, the wedding is being planned. I always wanted our kids to have a, a church wedding, and uh, she, was, she was going to a large, rather formal type church. It was a Baptist church, Brother Sexton's church. Not, not, I don't mean formalistic in worship. I just mean it's a large church. I mean, you could, you'd throw a baseball, and you'd have trouble hitting the ceiling in that church. It's so high. And uh, they, they were going to plan a, a church wedding. Well, I, I was glad about that. I wanted her to have a church wedding. And... Uh, we went down there for the wedding then to go through the rehearsal and the rehearsal dinner and then the wedding the next day and all of that. And so the supper, big banquet, we had it catered in. People were serving and uh, nice food. I would have enjoyed the food a lot more if it hadn't looked like $100 bills flying out of my billfold as those people are eating. <laughs> and... Uh, most money I ever spend on one thing. My, I mean, Corvettes are cheaper than weddings, you know? <clears throat> and so I tried to enjoy that supper as best I could, being a Scrooge and all. 
or curmudgeon, might not be the word, right? <laughs> and Ebenezer, yeah, Ebenezer. And so the next day we go to the go to the wedding. Everything's set. Everything's beautiful. Everything's dressed. Big church, big church wedding. Uh, you know, it just I wasn't prepared for all the city of Knoxville, Tennessee, to be in that one church. You know, <laughs> so uh, I'm still thinking dollar bills going out of the billfold and standing out in the hallway before the ceremony started. Everybody else is gathering on the front. The groom and the groomsmen are all on the front waiting. I'm standing back in the hallway with Angela, and she's got her arm hand around my elbow and we're ready to march down the aisle and give her away to the groom and at that moment we're standing out in the hallway all alone we're waiting for the queue to march in you know and for the bridal march and she looks so beautiful dressed in that wedding gown it cost so much money <coughs> and so all <laughs> oh, my fault I should have never asked for a church wedding next time I'll say elope elope <laughs> And so we're standing out in the hallway, and it's just me and her. And uh, I looked at her, and she looked at me. She said, I can't believe I'm old enough to get married already. And I said, I can't believe it either. And uh, we looked at each other, and I could feel the hot tears welling up in my eyes. And I'm not a very emotional person. And at that moment, I could feel <laughs> that dude in the understanding in the tuxedo stealing our daughter. <laughs> and it's like, when I give her away, this time we'll never get her back. And so we're standing there in the hallway. And at that moment, I felt the emotions that you don't feel just about everything, you know. And my heart was full. My heart was tender. And I'm saying, when it comes to a banquet with the Lord, our hearts ought to be full. Our hearts ought to be tender. We ought to be feeling emotions. And we ought to be drawn to Him in such a way that we don't want to be parted from him. And so that's why we're having this message tonight, talking about getting ready for communion with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that you'd bless us in a, in a very special way. We pray that you'd just, Lord, you'd work on our hearts and help us to love you and want to be in communion with you. Help us to look forward, not to look upon this as just a ceremony uh, Thursday night. But Lord, it's a banquet where we sit at the table with you and Lord we fellowship with you and we realize what you've done for us and we realize what we have in store for the future and Lord we're awaiting your soon return to come back and take us home with you and Lord we just, uh, we just pray that you'd bless us, help us to have a right attitude towards the Lord's Supper in Jesus name we pray Amen. Now I know the banquet in this context is a, is a wedding banquet and I understand that in his context, is talking about offering of the kingdom by Jesus to Israel, which was refused, and then he turned, of course, and started the church. And uh, he will return to Israel one of these days, and the offer of the kingdom will still be good. And I understand the context of this, of this banquet, but it makes a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus offering us at salvation to come and sit at his table and to partake of all that he has to offer for us. Think first of the banquet itself. Number one, three simple points. Think of the banquet that we read about in Matthew chapter 22. The banquet itself, can you imagine the cost that this wealthy man, this wealthy father for his son, he's throwing a big wedding, he's throwing a big banquet and he must have gone to a lot of expense. I mean, they, they, must have, uh, they must have butchered dozens and dozens of sheep and oxen and all of the, the fine bakery products that they were brought in, all of the fine drinks and everything that they had furnished. He said his table was ready. And it must have been very costly. Do you know what it cost the Lord Jesus to invite us to come to his table for salvation? It cost him nothing less than the blood of his dear son. The Lord Jesus came and bled and died on the cross of Calvary for you and me who did not deserve it. And the cost was great. The cost was enormous. I mean, there's nothing else in the universe as valuable to the father as his own son. And yet he sacrificed his son so you and I could come to that banquet table and receive salvation. 
Oh, if you've been there, friend, boy, I hope you have. I hope you've been through the Lord for salvation. I hope you know what it's like to fellowship with him. I know. I just pray that you know what it's like to receive of him all of the great things that cost him so dearly that he has for you. Sanctif justification, sanctification, glorification that is yet to come, all of that has been provided for us and more. As Solomon said, we haven't seen the half of it yet. And think about the banquet. Think about the cost of it. Think about the care, how it must have been heart-wrenching. I'm mean, standing out in the hallway giving away a daughter to a, to a no-good groom. <laughs> that can rip your heart out. But think about a father, a heavenly father, who for a world of lost sinners gave his son to be beaten and spit upon and to be nailed to a cruel cross. What kind of care must have been in the Father's heart to see all of that? The Bible says that when Jesus hung upon the cross that the Father turned his back and Jesus said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It's because the Father couldn't look upon sin and at that moment hanging on the cross all of the sin of the world was piled on the shoulders of Jesus and the Father turned his back. All the care. The Father can see all that is going to happen. He knows it's coming. Oh, how it must have tugged at his heart to provide his son a sacrifice for you and me. Think secondly of the invitation. We thought about the banquet. Think about the, the invitation. He sent all of his servants out in uh, Matthew 22 uh, in verse number uh, 2 it says, And the kingdom of heaven is like a certain man which made a marriage for his son. And he, verse 3, Sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, that, but they would not come. The invitation. Boy, it was a free invitation. He said, Folks, all you got to do is come. It won't cost you anything. It's all covered. Paid for it all. All of the meat you'll eat. All of the barbecue. All of the cake. Everything you'll consume at the banquet. It's been covered. It's free for everyone. When you come to the table of salvation, it's all free to you and me. It costs the Father dearly, but it's free for us. And when he invited people to come, they knew they wouldn't have to pay anything, and yet some rejected. Think about the expanse of it. He's, he's sending them out into the highways and the byways and here and yonder. The father sent the, sent the servants to tell them, hey, there's a wedding for the son and you're all invited to come. And they went way over yonder and way over yonder. And the Bible tells us in the, in the New Testament, according to the Great Commission, that we're to go into all the world, to the uttermost part of the earth, with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The expanse of it. Boy, the greatness of that invitation. It was for everybody. The Bible says it's for whosoever will. Did you ever think about Jesus sitting out there and with the crowds listening to him and somebody would have said, uh, Master, can you tell me, can I go to heaven? And can you imagine Jesus saying, No, I'm sorry, you're the one of the ones I predestined to go to hell. Does that make sense? Neither does Calvinism. <laughs> and the basis of Calvinism, no matter how they explain it, if you try to say that to them, those in the Calvinist mindset will say, well, you just don't understand. You haven't studied it enough. I don't want to study it so much that they make our God out to be a mean old bully who just creates people to send them to hell with no opportunity to ever be saved. No, I believe that the Bible meant what it said the bride and the spirit say, come, and whosoever will may come. I love it. I love it. The expanse of the invitation and the urgency of it. Boy, he sent out this crew of servants. He sent them out, and they went, and they said, Master, they won't come. He said, go over yonder and invite some more, and go again, and go out into the highways and the hedges and invite them all. All things are ready. Man, the urgency of it. He said, go. Do you know how urgent it is to get people saved today? There's people dying. I don't know how many people die every minute. But somebody dies. Several people die in the world every single minute. 
I dare say thousands upon thousands since this message started, several people around the world have died. Did they know Jesus Christ as Savior? I doubt that they all did. I doubt that more than a few did. That makes it urgent that we tell people. That makes it urgent that we tell our family how to be saved. Raise our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It makes it important that we tell our mothers and our fathers how to be saved. It makes it important that we give a gospel tract to some stranger because they'll die and go to hell too if they don't hear. It's an urgent thing, this invitation to the supper. The urgency of it and then the love of it, the love of the invitation. The Father sent out invitations over here and invitations over here and invitations over here. You know why he was doing that? Do you think it was just so he could have a big party? No, the Father loves people. He loves sinners. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And it was his love. The love of the invitation was that he cared for the souls of sinners. And that's why he sent the invitations out. Oh, listen, maybe maybe somebody in this room or somebody out there listening to my voice right now and you've never trusted Christ as Savior. It is urgent that you accept the love of Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you can be saved, but don't put it off. Today is the day of salvation. You can be saved right there where you are. Notice thirdly, the, I want you to think about the blessing of this banquet, the blessing of it. <clears throat> what happens when all the people come to this banquet table of salvation? Well, the dying are fed and their life is preserved. Their soul is fed so that their soul will be spending eternity with heaven. The lost are restored. All the lepers of those days were separated from their families. They couldn't live in the towns and then even in their own home where they lived previously. And they had to be banned to leper colonies to perish in loneliness. Leprosy is a picture of sin in the Bible. And when he invites us to his table, oh, even though we may be as leprous as a running sore, he invites us to come and he'll clean us up and make us white as snow. The lost are restored. The hungry are filled. Those who are hungering and thirsting for God will be filled at his table. I want to read, read one passage of scripture. I'd like for you to turn there with me, if you would, in 2 Samuel chapter 9. It illustrates what we're saying perfectly in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter number 9. David ascends the throne after Saul is dead. David has been friends with Jonathan, the son of old mean King Saul. Saul's dead. Jonathan's dead. But because of the love and friendship that David had with Jonathan, Saul's son, he wanted to reach out to see if there was any of the family left after he became king. And here's what we find in 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse number 1. It says, and David said, Is there yet any that is left, left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel in Lodibar. Lodibar meant a place of starvation, a place of no bread place of hunger, place of need, Lodibar. Verse 5, Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel from Lodibar. <clears throat> now when Mephibosheth, 
the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David. He fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not. The reason he would fear is because the new king normally would wipe out the family of the previous king so there could be no claim to the throne to interfere with his own rulership. And so Mephibosheth probably thought, I'm done for. He's going to wipe me out. David said unto him, verse 7, Fear not. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy king's, uh, the, the, thy father's sake and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father and thou shalt eat bread, watch this, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. David could have had him put to death and he was lame and he lived in a place where it was called famine, house of no bread place of need, David could have done away with him and nobody would have thought much about it. David said, I want you to come and eat at the king's table. Verse 8, and he bowed himself and said, what is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called him Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertained to Saul and to all his house. <coughs> thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always, underline that word always, always at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And then said Ziba unto the king, according to all my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at, the, at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Oh, what a beautiful story. Here's someone who thought he was worthless. Here's someone who really being lame, he would offer no threat to just about anybody. And he was, com he was completely helpless to do anything on his own. He couldn't even farm his own land. And David gave back to Mephibosheth all that King Saul had owned, the land. He said, you put your servants out there and I'll command them to work for you and they'll bring in the crops. And you, old boy, Mephibosheth, you sit down here at my table and we're going to have chicken and dumplings together and we're going to have fancy cakes and pies and we're going to eat the finest things that's available to anybody and you're going to eat the king's food. You know what we've got when we trust Christ as Savior? We have got the king's table spread before us. All the goodness of the land is ours and one day we'll eat at a literal table when the kingdom of God comes in literally we will have the marriage supper of the Lamb and we'll have a wonderful, wonderful time with the Lord Jesus sitting at the king's table. Oh, it ought to make your heart glad. It ought to make you excited to say, you know, I'd like to get a little taste of that banquet right now and I want to just sit down at the Lord's supper table on Thursday night and just fellowship with him. I just want him to know that I love him. I just want him to know that I'm glad that he didn't do away with such a dead dog as I am because he didn't owe me anything, and yet he gave me everything. Oh, what a time we'll have when we get to be alone with the Lord Jesus in heaven, and until that time, we can fellowship with him right here on earth. We can fellowship with him in times like this, and with his brethren. At the Lord's Supper table, he called his disciples together, and he said, I want to eat this last meal with you, with you, and he called, them, he called them all together. And they sat there together and they had that very special meal with the Lord before he went to the cross. That's what we commemorate when we observe the Lord's Supper. Somebody might wonder, well, just how do you do the Lord's Supper? Well, here's the way we do it. Different churches do it different ways. And every church is free to do it however they want to. I think the way we do it is biblical. 
first of all, you have to be saved. You can't fellowship at the Lord's table without partaking of the salvation that he offers. So to participate in the Lord's Supper, you need to be saved. You need to be baptized. He commanded the first act of obedience after we're saved is to be baptized. And so it'd be hard to be in fellowship with him if we refuse to be baptized. And thirdly, we need to be right with God. If you're going to have communion, sweet communion with the Lord, you don't want to be crossways with God. You want everything to be right in your heart towards him. If there's any sin you're harboring in your heart, any grudge or any ill feelings, get them taken care of. Anything that hadn't been confessed, 1 John 1, 9 says that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we confess them, if we confess them. And so that's how we take care of sinfulness on a daily basis. And so before the Lord's Supper, you want to be saved, baptized, and confessed up. And number four, you want to be right with your brethren. You see, it's hard to sit around a table and fellowship with the Lord if you're mad at the other guys in the group. And so, <clears throat> saved, baptized, you're right with God, right with your brethren. If you've got a grudge against somebody, mad at somebody, or you hadn't made uh, amends of, over something, that would be a good time between now and Thursday to get everything straightened out. Even if they're not in this congregation, if they're in some other congregation, if things are crossways, maybe some other preacher, the thing to do is just get on the phone or go see them if they're close enough to drive and get things straightened out with anybody that you're crossways with. And that way you're on good terms with God and good terms with the saints around the table. And this is a good time. I'll mention this one last thing. This is a good time for parents to train their children. Since, since it's saved people that are fellowshipping together around the table, if a child's too small to be saved, then, of course, you take this opportunity to teach them. One of these days, if they're too little to understand, you teach them. One of these days, when you're ready, you can be saved. And when you're saved... You get saved, you get baptized, and you can partake of the Lord's Supper too. And so use that as a training time, a teaching time, so the children know that, hey, this is a very special time. This is limited to the born-again children, the saints of God, to fellowship around the table with their Savior. And so we'll do that on Thursday night, and we'll meet here at 6 o'clock. We'd invite anybody who's saved, baptized, right with God and right with their brethren to join in with us. Would you bow your heads, please, and let's pray together. Our Father, we, we love you. And thank you for that table you spread for us. Thank you for the table of salvation that whosoever will can come and partake. Lord, thank you for the table of communion that we'll observe Thursday night where the saved folks gather around the table and remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. And we'll remember what he did in his resurrection. Lord, we'll remember about him coming back again at the second coming. Lord, help us to think about those things with a great deal of anticipation, expectation, and satisfaction that we have in joining with the brethren around the table with the Lord in communion. I pray that you'd bless us during this time of invitation. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you stand with me? And while no one's looking around, if you need to come to the altar, I invite you to come. You can come and you don't have to tell anybody what you're praying about. You can come and just pray. If there's something you need to get right with God, you can just kneel here and get it right. Would you come right now? Just come on. Always, always want people to feel comfortable about coming to the altar. someone who's never been saved I want you to know Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins they've been paid for all you have to do is receive the salvation that he offers you and salvation is not necessarily in a plan it's in a man salvation is in the Lord Jesus Christ you could actually be a theologian and go to hell it's when you come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior 
that's when you're born again. Trust what he did for you on the cross of Calvary, wherever you are. Just bow your head and say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I don't deserve heaven, but I don't want to go to hell. I believe you died for me on Calvary's cross to pay for my sins. Lord, please save me. I'm placing my faith in you. I trust you as my Savior from this day forward. If you do that, you can put it in your own words. It's better than your own words. You believe on him, trust him. He'll be your Savior. He wants to save you. Oh, more than your heart could ever imagine. He wants to save you. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to be baptized. He wants you to be a member of the local Bible preaching church. He wants you to be involved in his work, reaching others for Jesus Christ. If you've never done all of those things, how about getting started on it? Just ask him tonight to give you the power to do what you know is right to do. Thank you for being here tonight. God bless.